Today is November the 15th, 2020. Don Crossland gives a sermon entitled, Gateways and Barriers to Receiving and Walking in the Holy Spirit. You know, I remember reading about John Wesley and um, I believe it was in a little place called Aldersgate Chapel and he said his heart was strangely warmed and I understand what that means don't you <clears throat> so I have to tell you tonight my heart is strangely warmed and when I say strangely warmed it's uh you know, you look at circumstances, you look at the world, you look at a lot of different things, and you think, how could your heart be strangely warmed? Well, I think it's in the presence of the Lord. Uh, when he speaks to you and you hear his voice, and you say, oh, that's what you mean. That's what you're doing. Your heart is, in, is warmed and encouraged. So tonight I'm going to ask, you turn to Acts chapter 1. And actually, I had not intended to share this teaching until some other time because I felt like there was more I needed to get down. And, and our uh, ministry council, the guys kept saying, Don, you're to share this Sunday, you're to share this Sunday. And, and uh, finally, I, I was convinced by the Holy Spirit, that's right. And so I'm going to do that. Uh, I will tell you, I may not get all the way through, and if I don't, I'll stop at a certain point, but uh, I don't want to take long, and I'm not really going to review that much of the last week, but some of you may not have been here. I simply spoke on the three realms of the Holy Spirit. One, when we're born again, the Holy Spirit comes into us, and we're to abide in the Spirit. You can get the tape from last week. Uh, then as we are being filled, there's an inward filling. As we're being filled, be ye being filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5, uh, that's an inward filling. The result of that are the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, we're to learn, and I explained last week, how to abide and how to grow in those areas. And then thirdly, I shared about being baptized uh, with the Holy Spirit and uh, uh are in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit baptizes us with power. And uh, that's more than an inward filling. It's an outward filling. Luke says, you will be clothed with power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And so when we have that inward filling, be ye being filled, Ephesians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, the Greek word is played rue. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, he clothes us. And that word sometimes is used in the book of Acts as the word also filled. But it's from the Greek word play through. And that means an outward filling. I hope you'll keep remembering that. And the result of that is power. Now, what I want to teach on tonight is this. How do you receive and walk in this in the Holy Spirit. Because we all know the dilemma. You, I, I have been in the past somewhat of a student of revival. And I was always amazed how the, the Spirit of God would move in an area in great revival. And it would last hardly a generation. And what surprised me was in the next generation, the whole realm the se seemed to move into darkness. And I could not understand it. And uh, there would be local areas where the Spirit of God would move in great power. People would come from all over the world. But read about it about eight or nine, ten years later, and often the church is dwindled, and people are confused, and there's been division, and people left. And I think, well, what, what went wrong? The Holy Spirit wasn't wrong. And I think it's because we don't often know how to walk. There's a place to walk in the Holy Spirit. There's a place to, to keep being vitalized, being strengthened. And the scripture says, be refreshed, which means to be re-encouraged, re-energized. And, and if you don't keep growing in the spirit and walking in the spirit, you're not going to be energized. And I can tell you the days will come if you don't know how and what to do. You're going to find yourself uh, crying out to God and say, hey, what happened? So what I want to do tonight 
is this. I, I may answer some questions or try to that you may have never thought about. I hadn't until the last few days, and and uh, I've been speak. I've been uh, reading about the Holy Spirit and manifestation that comes with the, when we're baptized by the Holy Spirit. Uh, there is power. So let me also explain this in the beginning that uh, when when the Holy Spirit comes in power. Uh, and I'll share it in just a little bit how there are certain manifestations, but they're not all the manif same manifestations, though there are nine of them. But it's important to remember when we talk about the baptism of the Spirit, when you become a Christian, the book of 1 Corinthians says, by one Spirit, you're all baptized into one body. Did you know that? There's a place where the Holy Spirit baptizes you into one body. And so that's the reason you can have fellowship. It's called the fellowship of the gospel. Is that if another person knows Christ, you know Christ, it's like we're a body, we're a family. Because the Holy Spirit baptizes it. Not only is he in you, but he baptizes you into that one body. But John the Baptist says, but Jesus, the Lamb of God, is going to baptize you with water or with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So there's a place where the Holy Spirit baptizes you in the body of Christ, but there's also an event where Jesus himself, the baptizer, is going to baptize you with power. Now, in the book of Acts, it's so interesting. We often study Acts chapter 1. I have all these years. And I have to tell you, I never saw what I'm seeing in the last two weeks. Just reading Acts chapter 1, and I thought there has to be some keys in the book of Acts chapter 1. Because suddenly in chapter 2, the Holy Spirit, suddenly the day of Pentecost comes, and the power of the Spirit comes. And I find four places in the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit comes upon a group of people, and they all speak in tongues. I'm going to explain that in a moment. But then there are others. It doesn't record that. So I'm going to explain because I just saw it today. And I've been crying out to God in the last few days. And I said, God, why is that? And why? what's the distinction? Some people feel the Spirit and, uh, and it seems like are baptized by that. I mean, are coming upon in power. And they all begin to speak in tongues. But have you noticed there are other places where many individuals, it says nothing about them speaking in tongues at that time. When Paul became a Christian, in fact, it says by the Holy Spirit that he was led to be ministered to by a guy named Ananias. And, and the Holy Spirit came to Ananias in a vision and told him that he was to minister uh, to Paul, then called also Saul. And, you know, he was concerned. He said, well, I, I hear he's been killing, killing Christians. And the Lord ministers to him. And so he meets Paul. And uh, it's interesting because in Paul's vision, when he received the Lord, he was blinded by this brilliant light. In fact, he said the Lord appeared to him. And uh, you, uh, I could say a lot about visions and dreams because in some places where the Lord spoke, it says some of the people only they thought it thundered. Other heard his voice and some didn't hear anything. And so it's like if our hearts and eyes are not open, we often don't hear anything. We have to be willing to be open. But nevertheless, when Paul baptized, uh, or when Ananias baptized Paul, it is interesting. It says that Paul, that his, he was filled with, he prayed for him. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. That word is play through. That means the Holy Spirit came upon him. Now, you would have thought he would begin speaking in tongues. He doesn't at that time. It's not recorded. Did he later? Probably because he says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. Then what happened? It says that his blindness was taken away and his eyes was open. He received the manifestation of healing and seeing. It didn't mean the others didn't come. But I found other individual places and where you're sure that they were baptized by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit came upon them. It doesn't record it, but you see the emphasis, the evidences of it later. But why are there only four places that when they speak in tongues, they begin, when they're baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, they begin speaking in tongues? And I'm going to try to explain that to you. And I, I, as I said, I've never seen it until this afternoon. 
And I was so, I was so uh, joyful because for, it gave me an answer that I'd cry out to God uh, for years about. So let me start in Acts chapter 1. I'm going to give you some, some uh, areas where we actually can walk continuing in the receiving and the power of the Holy Spirit. Because otherwise, we're going to hit a brick wall somewhere. There are going to be some areas we're going to kind of get pulled back in. So I'm going to try to cover these as quickly as I can. If you want to jot down, I'm not going to read all the scriptures in detail. But in Acts chapter 1, and we find that the keys are given there. In fact, I've written down seven. I probably won't get through all seven tonight, but I've written down seven. And here's the first key. I may later re-identify them, but I call it the uh, uh, information and word of revelation. You know, what I've discovered is when God gives us something, he explains to us what it is. A lot of people are asked to receive the Holy Spirit, and they've never been told who the Holy Spirit is. And I remember in the early days of my ministry, I would, I would pray, I'd hear people talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and, 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 and in my denominational background, at that time, we said you got everything of salvation. Do you ever hear that? Well, you've already got it. And I remember going to my office one day, and I just fell on my face before God, and I said, well, God, if I've got it, where is it? Because I wasn't seeing much. And see, I really do believe we have Christ and we have everything. He is poured out without measure. But here's the difference. We may have all of the Holy Spirit, but he doesn't have all of us. And there is more. And often we need information, instruction by the word of God, what that more is. Now, he can tell you personally, but also good to have someone that he can explain to. When I began teaching on the gifts of the Spirit, and, and you know, I, I don't want to toot my own horn, but we call them motivational gifts. There was a man who started writing some of that. Then I helped take up with some of that and worked for about three years, day and night almost. I ministered. At that time, I was helping to work with about fifteen to 20,000 pastors and all of the nation. I would meet with different ones, and I began to help them discover their spiritual gifts. And, uh, and But in that process, I saw characteristics of the motivational gifts. And I, I began to discover when I would share the whole gamut of spiritual gifts that there are, there are um, gifts, uh, there are ministries, there are manifestations and effects. And when I began to give the outline of those four different places in the scriptures, it's like suddenly people saw, hey, that's right. Because they began to discover. And when they had scriptural truth information given by the Holy Spirit, I was amazed how many people immediately received. But when there's confusion, often what people, they will first come into understanding of a gift through an example of someone. Now, sometimes that can be wonderful. People say, you have joy and glory, and they say, man, I want that. But you know what? A lot of people reject the package that the gift comes in. So just remember that. And uh, that's too bad, but they do. That's the reason he says, don't despise prophesying. Because sometimes prophesying kind of comes in packages that may be not your best taste, but it's okay. You know, I could tell a lot of stories of people who prophesied to me with my background. It's kind of hard to receive, but I learned to say, boy, if it was a prophetic word by the Spirit I could discern, it doesn't matter what they look like or act like, how they talk, I would discern that, but I listen to the Spirit. So, number one, there needs to be instruction and there needs to be information and the Word of God and revelation about the Holy Spirit. And if we don't have that and teach that in a church and to people, they're probably not going to enter into it in its fullness. Sure, he can come upon you, but you'll find almost everywhere in the scriptures where they received, there, there was a clue. There was somewhere where the Holy Spirit's teaching had been given. If you've never been taught about the manifestations, how do you hear the word of God? A spirit of knowledge, a spirit of wisdom. You may experience that. I had a, I had a friend who said, well, I didn't know you could hear God. I just knew I had a hunch sometimes. But you know how to discern the word of God. You need teaching. Do you not? So let me show you. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, 
It says, the first account I composed, Theophilus, this is Luke the writer, about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. He kept a pretty good record of it until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he, by the Holy Spirit, gave orders, commands, uh, to the apostles whom he had chosen. Well, can you see how each of these could be several teachings? And uh, so he starts, he gives it to the apostles. He had chosen them. You'll find that where he says, uh, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you all the way into the end of the age. Uh, that's another whole different realm. But he says, to these he also presented himself alive, they walked by life, after his sufferings by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now I'm just going to, just to get through this because there's so much, but I want you to understand that the teaching, notice the preparation for these people in the book of Acts. In fact, when the Holy Spirit came and they preached the gospel, 3,000 people received Christ. It didn't just happen. There was a lot that went behind it. Do you realize after the resurrection, Jesus taught for how many days? 40. Have you ever, did you know that every time there's a number, there's a meaning for that number? When there's 40, it's not the number of testing because of the number four. 40 often is ending an old period, and it's the door to a new. In the 40 is four, which in the Hebrew is always a door. So it rained for 40 days and 40 nights in the days of Noah. The old world was passing away, and a new world was coming. Amen. When Israel came out of Egypt, they wandered for 40 years in order there was an old that was passing away. It took that long to get, they got out of Egypt, but it took that long to get Egypt out of them. And they were entering into the land of promise. Forty days, the Lord was tempted by Satan. He was defeating the kingdoms of this world. And then he offered new and a living way. And it says he went forth in the power of, and that word is not dunamis, which means signs and wonders and miracles. He received that earlier, but the word there is exousia, which is authority. And the next thing we find, he's casting out demons. And so 40 is important. So for 40 days, he's bringing the people out of the old into the new. And what does it say? It says... Uh, experience concerning the kingdom of God. That is so awesome. If there was nothing else to read tonight, do you realize for 40 days he ministered to his disciples and others about the kingdom of God? 40 days. What would it be like if Jesus was here for 40 days in a conference? And, he's, yeah, and he spoke on the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is the kingdoms, the kingdom of God. It's somebody who said his way of doing things. The kingdom of God are his ways. There's a kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And one has to do, I think, more with atmosphere and strategy. And the kingdom of God has more to do with people. But there are ways of God in the kingdom. There are ways in the kingdom of heaven. And his kingdom is within us. And it's vast. It covers the universe. If there are so many ways of God in the natural in, it says his ways are in the sea. His ways are in the sanctuary. That's in the heavens. His ways is how that he works. His character, his nature. There's so many of them. They're awesome. So 40 days, he was preparing them. That's one thing. Many people do not know the ways of God. You know, they stump their toe. They get angry. And it says the children of Israel only knew the acts of God. They had somebody who was healed or they were healed. And they get so excited. And that's wonderful. But one day something happens. There's a difficulty. There's a crisis. And if you don't know the ways of God, you're going to say, God, I don't know that I can believe you. I don't know your ways are true. I thought you healed. Well, sometimes maybe it's a matter of timing. Sometimes read the scriptures. You'll say, oh, God doesn't change his mind. Oh, yes, he does. 
He doesn't change his nature. He doesn't change his character. But he may change the way he operates depending on us. And we sometimes think, oh, it's awful. No, if we could really see God's the way he sees, he is so minutely in knows the details of your life. He knows when a sparrow falls. He knows the number of the hairs of your head. I would say he knows us pretty good. Let me tell you something I learned years ago. I have learned when my ways do not satisfy, my ways don't seem to fit up with God's way, and I'm dissatisfied because I've seen his acts. I learned this years and years ago. I can't tell you what year is. Let God be true and every man a liar. And I remember saying, God, I don't understand this. It doesn't make sense to me. But I will admit that you are God. You created the universe. There's nothing you don't know. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense to me. I've even gotten angry at God. But I still say, let God be true. And he is. So I give him thanks. I don't always feel it, but I give him thanks. And uh, But see... Children of Israel knew his acts. Well, Moses didn't just say he knew his ways. God made known his ways to Moses. Ah, there's a big difference. You know what that is? It meant as he learned in life, God made his ways known. We don't usually, we're not usually born without wisdom. But as we grow, as we experience, as we go through difficulties, God will make them known to us. Sometimes we have to look back after we've been angry and you know gotten mad. I've done that. And say, now God, I understand. I, I see your ways. But anyhow, there must be the revelation of the word. And in every place the book of Acts, where the Holy Spirit has lived, experienced the fullness of the Spirit, I'm not going to take the time, but I've carefully searched the Scriptures, and in every case, I have found where either they were talked about the anointing, or on one occasion, like the church at Ephesus, Paul said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you uh, became a believer? And they said, we don't even know if there be any Holy Spirit. And he says, what then unto whose name were you baptized? They said, John. Well, he baptized in that name in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's so much in each of those passages. There were 12 men at Ephesus that received this fullness. And then he laid hands upon them. They began to speak in tongues and prophesy. That was, remember, that was a corporate group. You'll find when someone usually like that, they all speak in tongues. It's always, I've noticed, it's corporate. There's a reason for that. I'll show it. Now let's go to number two. So does that kind of make sense? You learn to walk in the Holy Spirit by revelation of the Holy Spirit and the ways of God. And that's reason it's so important to read the Scriptures, but also to let the Scriptures become alive to you and work in your heart. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against God. Because that's where you get revelation. You know, he can speak to you in many different ways, but that's one way. Now, do you, I need to say this. Do you realize that God may have started speaking to you when you were a little baby? He started getting you ready way back there. Do you believe that? See, I didn't hear about the Holy Spirit till, you know, I, I, I was saved. I received the Lord in a little Baptist church, fundamental. I knew it was real. Boy, I had no question. I didn't know much about the Holy Spirit. I didn't even know that he was born of the Virgin Mary. Now, I wouldn't have denied it. I sure did not, but I sure didn't understand it. And I visited some friends with some friends at a Pentecostal Holiness Church, and boy, it was different. I didn't understand it, but something in my spirit said, there's a reality to that. Now, I saw some things. I read the scripture. Blah, blah, blah. But you know what? I knew there was a reality. Uh, but it's interesting. Sometimes you've, had, you've heard something, you've seen something, you may not accept it all, but something clicks in you and say, there's reality to that. You know what? Sometimes in our homes, there are pictures, little books, statements we've heard, and they've stuck with us, haven't they? You know, I, my mom used to have a little picture. And remember, we were a non-Christian home. She came from a Christian home. Said At one time, she told me she'd become an agnostic or an atheist. I didn't know that. Then she came to the Lord in fullness of salvation. But we used to have a little picture. It says, uh, I'm, I'm not going to quite try to quote it. I, I can't remember. Except we had a picture of the angel who was helping this little boy and girl, I guess brother and sister, across this partially broken bridge. Any of you ever see that picture? 
I was a little kid when I saw that. I used to marvel at that picture. And you know what? That was a, that was a gateway for me to engage angels. God put it in there years and years ago when I was a little boy. And I didn't know anything about angels. But he will give you pictures. It may be a book. It may be a statement. It may be something you've heard. But it's like God's putting a gateway. Now, there can be negative gateways, okay? But he can put a positive gateway that starts preparing you uh, to receive the Holy Spirit and to walk. Number two. Um, let me go. If you'll go then. In number two, uh, this one is a little bit more involved. In number, beginning in verse four. So there has to be a word, okay? Number one, verses one through three, there's a word of revelation that explains, it prepares us. But then the second area is don't get distracted by other things, wrong questions, that's not the now word of the Lord. So listen what happens. It says, gathering them together, uh, well, see, that's... that's uh, before I get to that distraction, I should call this one. There is a waiting for the promise. I apologize uh, as I wrote this down. Number two, first, is that we receive his word. We, we're given understanding. But number two, we are to wait for the promise. We receive his word. We understand what he wants to do. And in verse 4 and 5, it says, Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father, wait for the Father, what the Father had promised, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That's important. Now I'm going to show you later the distraction. But number two, after you've heard the word of promise, number two is you wait. Do you know a lot of people have difficulty waiting? They want it right now. Now it may not be many days, but God soon is usually later than our soon. His windows are usually a bit broader than our windows. But you know, it's interesting. Uh, he says, wait. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait. Let me tell you one of the biggest mistakes a lot of people make. I've seen it through the years. They leave too early. And they don't wait long enough. I've seen it, I've seen it, I've seen it. And uh, we have to learn our spirit when God says, Wait. Don't leave. Sure, there's a place where there's a time we leave. There's a time when the Lord says, hey, come up from among Babylon. There is that place. But through the years, and I've, in fact, I've been here almost 20 years. And I don't say this to be boastful. I have no regret what I'm going to tell you. Right before I came here and after, I was asked, if I would come and work at ORU, they would give me my master's, I would work on my doctorate, and if I'd become a professor in their counseling department. You'll say, oh, don't you miss it? No, the Holy Spirit didn't tell me to do that. Now, that's before I came here, but he told me when I was to come here. It was a remarkable thing. Then I got here. Uh, IHOP, International House of Prayer, Mike Bickle. Uh, asked me, I came and taught there two or three times, and they approached me, would you come and move here? Uh, would you, we want you to oversee this program, about a hundred ministerial students, and, and also teach in our school. And you know what? You think, man, there's all kind of people to give. You know what? I love that place, wonderful people, but the Holy Spirit didn't tell me to do that. The Holy Spirit says, wait, don't leave Nashville. So I'm not trying to impress you. I'm just trying to tell you. There are times you just, you don't leave. And you know what? When you know, don't. No, no frustration over it. You just know. Josh, I heard say, there's no safer place in the world than to be in God's will. Wait. Just wait. Don't leave. Wait. And you know what? You'll know in your spirit and there's a place to wait, and I can tell you. There's some, some things, if I had not waited, I wouldn't have experienced today. 
You, know, you may not can see them, but I can tell you there are blessings beyond anything that I thought I would experience. By waiting. And you know what? There's more to come. There's more to come. And uh, wow, he's showing me much of what he's planning to do. But wait, he says, don't leave. Don't You get discouraged, don't leave. You get discouraged, don't leave. Wait, wait, wait for the promise. Now don't wait if if you don't have that assurance. But if you have it and you've heard the voice of the Lord, wait. Because I can tell you, our God is faithful. Do you believe that? I can tell you, he is faithful. We may not be sometimes, but even when we are, he still is. That, that's the good news of his grace. That's number two, is wait. Be patient. P- learn to persevere, even when it doesn't look good. If God has told you to be somewhere, be someplace, don't leave. Wait. Sometimes you may believe, but you can always come back. God, God, I believe that, that God can restore even the order that he has us in. That's his grace. Number three, though, you know, we've heard his word. He's told us where to be. Where to, I think God has a place for us to be. But number three, uh, ver, verse six through uh, nine. I believe that's it. Or eight, six through eight. So when they had come together, boy, there's a place for coming together, people. You need that. You encourage. When they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? Don't be distracted by a wrong focus. That's, that's number three. Don't be distracted by a wrong emphasis. And they ask a simple question. Lord, is it this time, is that at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now see, when, the, when Jesus came, they believed in a Messiah, but they thought in the coming of the Messiah that he was going to undo the Roman burden, that he was going to bring them into freedom, set up a kingship, and they would have all kind of blessings on this earth. Well, they didn't understand that Jesus was going to come as the suffering servant. They couldn't see that in prophecy. So there's nothing wrong with that question. Is God going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is he going to restore Israel? Absolutely. All you have to do is read Romans 19, 11. No question. But some people through the years, I've watched them, they'll get off on the wrong emphasis. They'll get on some question out there, some emphasis. But God has an emphasis, a message in every church. If you don't believe it, read Revelation chapter 2 and 3 of the seven churches. But with that revelation, he will give a revelation of himself. And that revelation of himself will give you what you're supposed to do and the power to become that. That's important. That's the reason he gathered them together. He will gather you with the people and the place where that message, that heart that you have, either you have it or it will be brought to you. He'll give you the grace, and he will, his revelation will give you the power and the authority, the grace to fulfill that. Just make sure you're not going against you. You know what? If I were in a place, and I have been at times, where I realized the message, the, 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 what it put in my heart, was not where someone else was going. You know, I didn't cause a problem whatsoever. I've always, every place I've ever been, you can ask the pastor, I've been one of the most loyal. I've tithed, I've given, I've never spoken against them. And some places where I wasn't pastor, but there was a number of years where I had seminars around the nation. I always supported my minister. But there was a time when I thought, I can't be here anymore. Not that I don't love the pastor, but we're, we're, on whole, we're in whole different streams. So I didn't do anything to make it difficult, to look awkward. In fact, there was a particular ministry that I was in. I thought, Lord, I, I just this isn't where I'm supposed to be anymore. It's against the grain. But I don't want to cause problems because I was in a position of leadership that it would cause confusion among a lot of people. Why is he leaving? What is he doing? And I did not want to do that. And so the Lord says, I want you to stay for one more year and be a servant. Don't complain. Don't gripe. Be a servant. And you know what? There was no confusion. When the time came, there was grace, and it was right. 
But sometimes, if that person doesn't have the same message, they may have a good message, it may be right, but it may not be the message that God's put in your heart. And so I taught, I didn't just up and leave one day and surprise everybody. I went to him, I explained what I was hearing, and uh, he cried and I cried, but I waited until he blessed me to be released. You know what? I've had people years ago who would come into a church I was pastoring. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. They're coming from that church pretty well known. They're, I mean, you know, they'd be in a pretty well known position. And I thought, man, I'm not just going to go and pull sheep over. And so I would call the pastor. I would, I'd ask them, is it okay if I call your pastor? And I would call their pastor and I said, such and such is visiting our church. And boy, I want you to be blessed and I want you to have harmony. And I just want to make sure that, that this isn't going to bring confusion. It isn't going to bring uh, difficulty to you. And I remember this one person said, oh, no, no. He said, Donna, I believe it's time for them probably to come to your church. Well, not my church, the Lord's church. I hope you hear what I'm saying. I mean, you see, a lot of time we saw we cause unnecessary confusion. Now, are there times you're to leave? Yes, probably running, but that's some different reasons. So, anyhow, don't distract, don't be distracted. And and they were by a message. They says, "When is he going to restore the kingdom?" It's like what's happening, what we're doing doesn't fulfill what they think it ought to be. Um. I may not get very far, okay? I'm already seeing that. I don't have much I'm sharing. Just get some stuff out of my system or it helps you. But I can tell you, in a Baptist church years ago, when we began moving the Holy Spirit, man, people began flocking in. And wonderful people, but some of those people had come from a Pentecostal background, and they were the people saying, man, you've got to go faster, you've got to go faster. And then some people who hadn't been there, but they'd seen division. Hey, don't slow down, slow down, slow down. Well, you have to hear the Lord. And so here were people, and they were saying, when, when will the kingdom be restored to Israel? Okay. You've got to hear this. This is really important. Boy, could they have got, it's a legitimate question, but it's not the emphasis right now. It's not the focus. Here is the focus. He says, verse 8, 7, It is not for you to know times and epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Now let me tell you, there are times that he tells us. I mean, there are times when God's told me how many years, how many days I was going to be doing something. There are times, and that word epic means seasons. But there are sometimes that have been fixed by the Father, and for reasons maybe unknown to us, He doesn't let us know. We'd probably screw it up. We'd try to make it happen in the flesh. We'd try to get ahead of the Father. For any number of reasons, it, some things He doesn't give us an answer to for our benefit and for His glory. But He does say something. He puts them back on the road that we're to be on, there to be on. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That's that clothing with power. You shall be, uh, he said, and you, uh, and you shall be my witnesses, here's the purpose of it, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. So Lord, help me to know if I have time to do this. I think I do. If you notice that he gives four things, he's going to refocus them. We have to know our focus. I think in days to come, we're going to see more our focus here. Yes. You know why the Lord told me in 2012 or before, he said change the name to Melchizedek Christian Church? Now, it would surprise you, the name Melchizedek, because it has something to do very special, as prophets had pointed out with the year 2012. It wasn't, I didn't even hardly know how to pronounce it. I had not much understanding, but I knew in a move of God that is yet coming that that's going to be a subject that will be emphasized being kings and priests. But I knew that probably wasn't going to be the name of the movement, but I knew that it needed to be a subject that will be brought forth. I've never been afraid of bringing forth a subject, a truth, when I know it's truth. 
I've done it with gifts. I've done it with the Holy Spirit. I've done it with baptism. I've done it with tongues through the years. But um, so I knew. But I also, there are some other things I know about the future. I mean, as far as what I believe that God's purpose is, I think we're going to see a great move of discipleship. That'll be another subject another time. But anyhow, he said, you will be witnesses. Now, this is the Jerusalem church he's preparing because they're the, this was the birthday of the church, Pentecost. And he says, you shall be witnesses. Not you ought to be. You're going to be. But isn't it interesting? He gives them a road map. What does he say? I'm going to write that at Jerusalem. And then what? Judea. And then what? And then what? Okay. The uttermost parts of the earth. Uttermost parts. And you know, for a long time, I was asking the question because when when many people started coming into that renewed baptism of the Holy Spirit in the Azusa Street Revival, everyone spoke in tongues. Wonderful. I'm glad. But then men began to teach, you aren't baptized the Holy Spirit unless you speak in tongues initially. Have you heard that? I did. Initially, that is the evidence. And they'd go through the scriptures. And I've done the same. I've found in four different places. Do I believe in speaking? Absolutely. I speak in tongues often. Over all my messages, I pray in tongues. Because out of tongues come uh, revelation and knowledge and prophecy and teaching. That's revelation knowledge with prophetic teaching. I won't take time to tell you how I got there. But it is so interesting. When I began to read these, there are four places in Scripture where people receive tongues. And they, uh, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they spoke in tongues. And I went through that in the last day or two. And I saw it. I don't see it all yet, but I saw it enough. And so let me just uh, see if I can give it to you. And I've got about four or five pages of notes. Um, I mean, overhaul. And so where did first, who first received that fullness of the Holy Spirit? It's Acts, what, two, at least four on. It says, they were all together in one place. It was at Jerusalem, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. They all began to speak with tongues. In fact, let me just read it, because this, this is the beginning. Acts chapter 2. This is the beginning. And it says, uh, there's a lot related to it. Oh. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. It's interesting, one place. And suddenly, there are suddenlies of God, you know that. But those suddenlies, there's a whole different teaching. When the suddenly comes, usually before the suddenly comes, there's a pattern that's in place. In fact, when Moses was to build the tabernacle, the glory didn't come until you read, I think it's Exodus chapter 40. It says, and when Moses had finished the work, the glory of God filled the tabernacle, the tent, and they couldn't even stand up to minister. And it suddenly came. Now, there was a glory there, but not like this. And whenever we come to God's pattern, God has a pattern for a church, for a movement. And it may take a while to get there, but when he has it in place... When that pattern fits the shadow because it's to be a pattern of the heavenly, and when they come under the shadow of the Most High, guess what happens? That suddenly happens. It's suddenly. We haven't reached the suddenly yet. There are times in my ministry where I've said, the wind of the Spirit falls. I've seen it. But each one had a different pattern because there was a different call in that church. I'm beginning to see the call here. And when we come into that pattern, that suddenly is going to happen. And so in the book of Acts, chapter 2, it says, uh, they were, the Holy Spirit came upon them. Uh, uh, the, they, there came from heaven noise like a mighty rushing wind. It filled the house. They were submerged in the, the Holy Spirit. There appeared to them tongues as uh, a fire distributed on themselves, and they tested uh, and they rested 
each one of them, and they were all filled, play through, with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now, there were all these different nationalities, and everyone heard them speak in their own language. Let me tell you what happened at Pentecost. You can read this over and over. All my life, at least growing up, I'd heard people say, well, what they really, this is what a pastor told me. He says, what they did, they were speaking in known language. It was a miracle. It's an evangelistic gift. Wait a minute. Then why does my scripture say in the book of 1 Corinthians, when a man speaks in tongues, no one understands him, but he speaks to God? Then what happened here? They all began to speak in tongues. There were different groups that was listening, and every man who heard them speaking in tongues heard them in their own language. There were two things. Happened. There was a gift of tongues, and there was a gift of miracles. The gift of miracles is that when they spoke in tongues, speaking to God, praising God, worse, there wasn't anyone immediately saved from them speaking in tongues. They were glorifying God. But every man heard them in his own language. That's the miracle. It can still happen. I've heard of it happening. And then Peter stood up and preached clearly the gospel, and 3,000 people got saved. Why should that be confusing to us? But see, they had, they had Acts 1. They had apostles. And then the second, I'm going to show you. I, I, I will show you yeah, Judea. And uh, I'm going to go to this scripture, Acts 10. I'm going to start with verse 1. Uh, as I said, I'm going to get no further than this, but it's okay. I feel like I'm really to give it. In Acts chapter 10, listen to what it says. Now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. Caesarea, and it says Caesarea is of Judea. And you can read the account, and uh, it says he was he was um, he, he would have been a righteous Gentile, a good man, and he sent a company to talk to Peter. And uh, anyhow, angelic ministry is involved here, and the result is uh, Peter comes and preaches to them. Now, what happens? It says. This is this is Cornelius. This is a room. This is uh, Cornelia in Caesarea of Judea. And while Peter, now he he already told them, you've heard how Jesus of Nazareth was anointed, and he'd had an angelic visit. So this wasn't not knowing something. They were ready. And when Peter preached, while he was yet speaking, the Holy Ghost fell upon them, and they began to all speak in tongues and glorify God. Are you following me? All of them. This is carpet. It's not one person. It's all of them. I want to show you why this is so important. Then uh, in Samaria, uh, Acts chapter 8, there's a man named Philip who was had been a deacon in Jerusalem church. Their church had been persecuted, and uh, he ended up going to Samaria in Acts chapter 8. Verses 14 through 18. Let me just find it. Verses 14 through 18. And Samaria, demons started crying out, people receiving the Lord. And then uh, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and, and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet... See, they had to to have received him. They had already been baptized, but they had him inwardly, but they had not received the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet come upon them. That's, there's a difference between in and upon. They had only simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. And the scripture says, uh, that three we see, and when the Simon and when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the hands, so I don't know that he says there they spoke in tongues, except that he says he saw something, and later, uh, so that may be a place we're assuming, but he saw it something. It doesn't say they spoke in tongues here, does, does it? I don't believe so. 
I was looking at that today. But nevertheless, a whole group, and they saw that through the laying on of hands, they received the Holy Spirit. So we have Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then, I'll just mention this one without reading it. In the book of uh, Acts, uh, chapter, let me find it. Um, Lord, help me with all my notes. Uh, yeah, it's in Acts chapter uh, 15. Acts chapter, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, Acts chapter 15, I think it's verse 6 through 8. Uh, there's another group that he, Acts chapter, what, 16? And it, and, uh, it was at Ephesus. Samaria, so I need to explain something. Jerusalem were the Jews. Judea, these were Gentiles. Samaria, they were half group. They were called mixed. In fact, you have to read their history because they were, some of them were not carried into captivity by Assyria. Uh, they got mixed with the Assyrian. They originally were Jews, I think. It was from Ephraim and Manasseh tribe, and they stayed in Samaria. Uh, they kind of had their own worship. They didn't accept all the Jewish Bible, only the Pentateuch. And uh, they did not worship at Mount Zion, but at a mountain called Gehaz Gehazim. They had their own altar and all that. And so it's interesting that God is dealing with each area. The Jews, the Gentiles, the Samaritans, who were kind of a half group, mixed group, that needed to come in. And you'll say, well, who was Ephesus? They said, we don't even know there'd be any Holy Spirit. And he said, well, under whose name were you baptized? They said, John. And he had them to be baptized in the Lord Jesus. Laid hands upon them. They began to speak in tongues and prophesy. 19. It's 19. Thank you. That's uh, Acts 19. I've got one more part yeah. that I want to give, and I'm going to close. I said seven. I'll, I'll only get a few, a few. But I want you to notice something. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and that almost part of the earth. You know why each of these places? Because each of these places reached and was a door to a whole people group. Four is a number of a door in Hebrew. Jerusalem was to the Jews. Cornelius was to the Gentiles. Samaria was to a mixed group. Remember when Jesus visited the woman at the well and she was from Samaria? He said, worship, she said, worship, the worship God here or in, in Samaria at that mountain? Gehazim. And the uttermost parts of the earth. Ephesus was, Ephesus was the capital of of uh, the province of Asia, which was, they said it's where the east met the west, and it was to the uttermost parts of the earth. And whenever they spoke in tongues, especially in Jerusalem, what God was saying, and the miracle of interpretation was given, a language, they didn't speak in language, they spoke in other tongues, and the Holy Spirit gave them interpretation, and they were worshiping God, and what God is saying is that wherever this happens, you shall be witnesses. It was to empower them to, to the, all the gateways of the world. I'm going to conclude with this. I know what you're thinking, sure. But I really am. I want you to go to the one other, one other gateway. Wow, is this important. One other gateway, at least at this time. Um, and it is found in verses 9 through 11. I'm going to read them. The first one that I mentioned, the gateway, was the gateway of the word of revelation. The number two was, uh, what was it, the promise? Waiting. Waiting for the promise. Patience, perseverance. Number three was focusing on the main thing. Let the main thing be the main thing. The message, not getting distracted. Number four, and this is number four. Let me see how I put it because it's, it's very, very important. I've got it listed. It's, it's really recognizing the supernatural. 
in your life. There are supernatural signs and events that God will give you. It may be a vision, a dream, but he will prepare you to walk in the Holy Spirit. See, not only is the Holy Spirit in you, but we can be filled with the Holy Spirit and we can walk in the Spirit. Now, there are some things I've heard, but I'm not going to share. I dare not share anything but what God has accomplished in me. But I know some things the Holy Spirit says beyond what I've even understood or experienced. But I want to read these scriptures to you, and, and I will be through. Verse 9. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking about or on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were going, uh, as they were gazing intently into the sky, while he was, uh, while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come to you the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. I want to just mention two or three things real quickly. In the very beginning, God gave them signs that prepared them for the coming of the Holy Spirit. I'm giving some of them. They are either gateways or they're barriers. And sometimes we don't even realize they're gateways. The word of the Lord, let me tell you, many of my engagements have come through reading the scriptures. And I would, so I could give you all kind of example. They're gateways, but don't let them be a barrier. Now, it's interesting, his very ascension was a gateway. It says two men, when he was ascending, stood by in white apparel. Now, I'm going to ask you, where do you find that? I may have missed it, but I've gone through the ascension, and I can't I can find in the grave when they came to the open tomb, they found two men, and I think they were, but I can't find them at the ascension. It doesn't mean they weren't there, but Acts 1 says they were there. Then it says, the same Jesus which is taken from you will so coming like manner, and I kept noticing the book of Revelation, it keeps saying, he will come to you quickly, he will come to you. See, there's a coming in us, and there's a coming to us, but there's a coming through us, there's a coming for us. And a lot of people read that and think, well, that only has to do with the second coming. Yeah, he's going to come again. But did you know he can come to us individually? He can come to a church? Read Revelation 2 and 3. Well, how's he coming? Revelation 1 says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, plural. And it says in Passion Greek translation, and he keeps on coming with clouds. The book of Hebrews speaks of that great cloud of wit, or Hebrews 11, that cloud 12, that great cloud of witnesses. He comes in clouds of witnesses. A lot of people don't realize it. There are supernatural signs. Over 50 years ago, I was pastor of a church in Renton, Washington. And it was a Southern Baptist church, wonderful people. God bless. That was in the Jesus People movement. We didn't know much about Jesus people, but they, you know, I'd ministered to some and they began to throng the church. And you could look out uh, on, on the parking lot and there'd be motorcycle gangs and some of the wealthiest people. One was executive vice president of Boeing aircraft. Another, I found out, I didn't know at that time, he was executive vice president of U.S. Steel Company. I'd baptized his wife, and then there were some other. And so here we had these, that class, and then we had motorcycle gangs, and we had Jesus people off the streets. That's what happens in real Christianity. God just pulls us together. And one morning, it was an unusual time. But see, it was in a certain stage. I don't have time to go through all the stages of church life. I know where we are. That was a different stage of church life. We are in a different stage. What happened today, I'm not trying to make happen at Trinity Baptist Church in Renton, Washington. What happened today, I can't make happen. What We have to know his revelation for this church today. What is his call? And we are Melchizedek Christian Church, and I believe we are an ascending church, and part of our order is going to be Revelation 4. It takes a while to get there. But nevertheless, one Sunday morning, I remember looking out. The place was crowded. Some people would even stand outside. We didn't need air conditioner. The, the windows would be open. Some would even be looking through the windows. It was kind of one of those unusual times when God came upon this little church and blessed it. 
there was an outpouring of the Spirit. I didn't know much about the Holy Spirit, but I'd had a minister who had prayed for me. In fact, his name was Dennis Sprint Bennett. He lived, he pastored St. Luke's Episcopal Church, and hundreds, thousands of pastors had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I actually, I visited him and got to know him pretty well, and he prayed for me in some certain areas. And I saw, I was amazed Whew, what happened. But I looked back one Sunday morning, and I noticed at the back there were two men. I never had seen them before. We had a lot of visitors, but I'd never seen them. I didn't even notice anyone greeting them. And almost everyone was gone, and they waited around until I was one of the last. And most people, that, that little church got everybody's name, and they'd visit them on Tuesdays, and, and it was really interesting. They had a great program, but, but they came to me. And they were about the same age. They looked alike to me. They weren't dressed in white, but they had business suits on. And they said this to me. I never understood. Have I ever shared this with you guys? I don't think I have. I didn't think so. I was, I was thinking about this morning. I felt like the Lord saying, share this tonight. And here's the scripture they gave me. When I started looking at it again, I almost started crying. And they said, we've come to share with you. They said, God sent us that he wants to show you something. This was almost 50 years ago. I couldn't have been more than 25 or 26. And they said, he is going to show you something. And this is a scripture that they gave me. I think I can find it here. Uh, oh, yeah, verse 5, 9, 5. He's talking about the mercy seat. Above it were cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. That's what they told me. Hebrews 9, Hebrews 9 5. That was their message. Two of them. And they said, we, God wants you to know about the cherubim, but it's not time to share with you now, and this is a verse. And they left. I never heard from them. They never came back. And I thought, man... There were a lot of cults in those places, and I thought, is that somebody trying to get in and be cultish and deceive? Never saw them again. Never. And I was saying, God, who were these? Were these two men who were angels? This past year, standing in the back, they weren't in business suits, and I didn't talk to them, but there were two men in white linen. And they said, we have come to release the cherubim and the glory of God. Wow. I haven't told you, have I? I never told one about, I just remembered it recently in Renton, Washington, Trinity Baptist Church. No one saw them. No one talked to them, which surprised me. But see, God may have started years ago to prepare you. He may have started years ago to prepare me for what he wants to do. I believe that. Now, but or not, I'm going to conclude. I could go on. I really haven't got to the main, well, I've got the main point. The main point is Christ. But I'm going to tell you, God wants us to walk in the Holy Spirit, to receive. Don't become impatient. Let, let him speak to us. Don't take or give little uh, thought to supernatural experiences in your life. You may have almost died. You may have been in an accident. You may have things in the past that's happened to you, and you've just kind of passed them off, and yet God was preparing you for now. You've been drawn for some reason. You don't understand it. We're not this big church with great choir, but I tell you, we have some of the greatest music I've heard, and it's awesome. I'm watching the people that he's bringing here. I know about what he's going to bring in the near future. It's going to be a pattern after Revelation 4. I don't have to get into all that. I have no, no question. I know that we're an ascending church. He has a call. It doesn't make us better. It just makes us more responsible. But I know what the two men in white linen, I know what they were conveying. But, you know, they... Angels can come as angels of light, so you can test them. But I know that Jesus is calling us, and he wants us 
He wants to close the old door and he wants to open the new door. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes to him I'll grant to sit down with me on my father's throne as I also overcame and sit, uh, you sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame sit down on my father's throne. But he also said this, he who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, and who shuts and no one opens. I don't know about you, but here's what I've gone through. There was a time, not so long ago in my life, that the Lord says, Don, stop looking back. In Hebrews it said, if you desire to go back to those old places, I'll give you that opportunity. But I want the promised land. I want what God has. I've never been afraid if I know it's truth. So I know that he's giving an open door. May not be many at first, but that's okay. They'll come. There's people out there yet God is calling. I already know. I don't know who they are. I just know he is. And, but we have to open the new and let him close the old. Some of you haven't closed the old. Memories guilt, shame, old systems, old belief patterns. You don't, you don't lose what is truth, okay, and what is good. But that which would take away is saying, Jesus, I follow you. I'm closing the old, but I want you to open. He opens the new door first. I've set before you an open door, and he who closes the door that no one can open. Some of you need to have the doors open. Some of you need to have old doors closed. 